When Israel was in Egypt land, then my people go. Oh, prince so hard they could not stand. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning or good evening, depending on what part of the world you're in. Thanks for joining us for another session of the Rising Tide Foundation. And previously, we had been doing some presentations on, you know, art and their effect on politics in the world. And today we're going to change it a little. It's going to be more historical, and I'll just read the introduction to the class. With the bold flourish of a quill, four million desperate souls became freed men on January the 1st, 1863. But were they really free? Or did the battle for their independence and economic survival just begin? Now, in history books, this is called the Reconstruction Era. But actually, what Magdalene is going to talk about today is the Emancipation Era. Because just because President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation to free these slaves, well, Okay, that's wonderful, but uh, you had four and a half million freed slaves, which is like one-seventh of the entire population of the United States at the time. But then I was thinking, since there's no slaves in the North, and they're in the South, that's really, in the South, it's going to be like one of every fourth person is a freed slave. This is enormous. These people, they had no possessions. You know, they were given one outfit of clothes once a year. They had no education. At the time, I've seen various estimates, the literacy rate, in the United States at the time, among white people, was 75, 80%. Some even put it as high as 90%. So it was quite literate population. The literacy rate among the freed slaves was slightly above zero, right? They weren't, it was illegal to teach them how to read and write. They had no skills. A few of them had some skills they had no home now suddenly you got four and a half million people who are freed what are you going to do with them what are they going to all go downtown on the main street and have like one of these occupy movements <laughs> what are they gonna... anyway i just the enormity of it is really mind-boggling and to the credit of the united states when other countries freed the slaves they didn't do this the United States did. They launched a program of emancipation. And Magdalena is going to go into the history of this. And without further ado, Magdalena, it's all yours. Thank you so very much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, say um, that this is precisely why I decided to do this presentation. Uh, it um, as a teacher, well, just elementary teacher, I'm always curious about how you actually um, 
convey an issue or a concept and how you teach it the best way. And I was very, very curious about uh, how do you actually uh, do this? How do you free 4 million slaves and then um, and then deal with the aftermaths of that? Um, so um, I'm going to share my screen. All right, everybody can see that? Okay, hold on a second. Okay, I'm trying to get that far away from me because it's always interfering in the reading. Um, how do you do this? Okay. Okay. Well, let's see. All right, so reconstruction of the South. Um, legally, the reconstruction area was defined as being uh, taking place from 1865 to 1872. Um, these were um, laws or yeah, time frames that were put in place by the US Congress. Unofficially, however, reconstruction started as early as 1861 and went approximately till 1876. Now these uh, 1861 to 1876 are kind of um, yeah, unofficial, they're very fluent dates. So don't hold me to it. Okay, so the uh, reconstruction area was the period after the American Civil War from 1865 to 1877 during which the United States grappled with the challenges of reintegrating into the Union the states that had succeeded and determining the legal status of African Americans. Um, presidential reconstructions from 1865 to 1867 required very little of the former Confederate states and leaders. Uh, radical reconstruction attempted to give African Americans full equality. And uh, you will see the term radical um, quite a few times in this presentation. So um, the reconstruction policies for the South determined what policies would prevail nationally. Uh, um, our friends of the American system, economics, very much uh, determined that this was going to be uh, a, a big battleground, that the South was viewed as an economic, political, and social back, back battleground, that Reconstruction was the means to eliminate the influence and control of British power in America. Um, and the South, if the South was going to be rebuilt along the line of the American system of political econo economy, um, it would be an irresistible force against the New York and New England centers of British allied financial power and economic, social, and political doctrine. So the idea, completing the American Revolution um, to, uh, to diminish or to eradicate the influence of uh, Britain uh, altogether once and for all. So the battle between these two factions, on the one side, the American system economic faction, and on the other side, the British economic, uh, British system economic faction, faction would determine the policy direction for the United States to the present day. And this raged, absolutely raged during the years 1865 to 1868. The battle between the faction culminated in a dramatic attempt to impeach President Andrew Johnson in 1868. This was a failed effort. Um, this effort can only be described as an attempted constitutional coup d'etat by the American system wing of the Republican Party, the radicals. They were called the radical Republicans. And here are some of the fighters for the American system. Of course, President Abraham Lincoln, um, who, yeah, okay, Henry Carey, uh, the great economist, uh, Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania, 
He was the Kerry's principal ally in the U.S. Congress. Stephen Caldwell was an author. He was not in the Congress, but he was a well-known writer on economics and also religion. And uh, Congressman William D. Uh, Pig Iron Kelly from Pennsylvania, um, among others. There are, there are many more, but these are, main, these are the main actors. On the Brit pro-British free trade uh, side, you had, um, after the death of uh, President Lincoln, you had President Andrew Johnson, Treasury Secretary Hugh McCulloch, Secretary of State William Seward, Senator Charles Sumner, Congressman James Garfield, Congressman George Julian, August Belmont, uh, who is the leader of the uh, Democratic Party. So these were pro-British free trade advocates. Uh, some of them were in favor uh, of abolishing slavery, but they were not in favor of pro-British free trade. Um, they were not in, in favor of abolishing pro-British free trade. So Henry Carey and Thaddeus Stevens defined the issue. Um, they made it very clear. If in order to throw off the yoke of foreign political and financial control of the nation, it was necessary to do the following. Um, protection of U.S. domestic industries. So instead of sending raw materials to Britain and then re-import uh, the finished product back into the United States, uh, they were in favor of protecting domestic industry, the production at the line. Um, they were in favor of confiscation of the large sovereign plantations. They uh, wanted to redistribute the land of those sovereign plantations in the form of family-sized farms, uh, especially to, for, the, for the freedmen. Uh, they were absolutely adamant that the nation's currency and credit had to be defended. And they said we had to deal with the massive national deficit created by the Civil War. So these were the points that Kerry and Stevens were uh, willing to do battle over. And they led the fight. So... Um, to start it off, on April 15, 1861, uh, President Lincoln uh, issued a proclamation to suppress the rebellion that happened after the attack on Fort Sumner. Um, he called forth the state militias, um, 75,000 tr troops, in order to suppress the rebellion. And he appealed that all loyal citizens to favor, facilitate, and aid this effort to maintain the honor, the integrity, and the existence of our national union. As the days passed immediately afterwards, senators noted that there was a tremendous response to the president's call for troops. The response of the loyal states to the call of Lincoln was perhaps the most remarkable uprising of a great people in the history of mankind, wrote Senator John Sherman of Ohio. Within a few days, the road to Washington was opened, but the men who answered the call were not soldiers, but citizens. So um, this is uh, some of the numbers here. Uh, the last census before the Civil War started um, was in 1860. And uh, it stated that there were 26,000, almost 27 million white people in the United States and about four and a half uh, million blacks. Uh, that's about 14% of the total population living in the United States. And as Jerry mentioned in the beginning, as you can see, uh, the very, very dark spots is an um, is, uh, intense uh, distribution of slaves. Um, you can see where the Mississippi is, okay, um, and how this uh, whole thing was uh, distributed. So the question after this, um, as soon as, uh, as uh, the Union soldiers went south and they started uh, fighting against the, against the Confederate forces, um, they right away uh, had um, former slaves or freedmen or, or escaped slaves 
uh, following them. So no sooner, this is from uh, uh, W. E. B. Du Bois. Bois, I call it. Jerry says Bois. Okay. Um, and in his book, he says, no sooner had the armies east and west penetrated Virginia and Tennessee than fugitive slaves appeared within their lines. They came at night when the flickering campfires of the blue hosts shone like vast unsteady stars along the black horizon. Old men and thin, with gray and tufted hair. Women with frightened eyes, dragging whimpering, hungry children. Men and girls, stalwart and gaunt. A horde of starving vagabonds, homeless, helpless, and pitiable in their dark distress. So, the question was, what to do with the slaves? Um... And some said, well, we have nothing to do with slaves. Hereafter, commanded General Halleck, no slaves should be allowed to come into your lines at all. If any come without your knowledge, when owners call for them, deliver them. So in, in other words, return them to their slaveholders. Method two was, but others says, we take grain and fowl, which are property, right? Um, why not slaves, which are also considered property back then? Whereupon Fremont, as early as August 1861, declared the slaves of Missouri rebels free, okay? So um, such a radical action was quickly countermanded, but at the same time, the opposite policy could not be enforced. Some of the black refugees declared themselves free men, Others showed their masters had deserted them, and still others were captured with forts and plantations. Um, evidently, too, slaves were a source of strength to the Confederacy and were being used as laborers and producers. So if you wanted to defeat the Confederacy, then you took away whatever they needed um, to make them weaker. So um, that part was the slaves. So they constitute a military resource, wrote the Secretary of War late in 1861, and being such that they should not be turned over to the enemy is too plain to discuss. So the tone of the army chiefs changed. Congress forbade the rendition of fugitives, and Butler's contrabands were welcomed as military laborers. This complicated the whole situation rather than solve the problem, because now the scattering fugitive became a scattering, a steady stream um, following the army, okay? And they came and, and followed the army as the army marched. You saw a band of, uh, of uh, freedmen or former slaves, escaped slaves, following the army wherever they went. And then, of course, with that came the issue of feeding them. So um, uh, this uh, is, uh, I'm discussing uh, the Port Royal experiment. Um, in November of, uh, 7th of 1861, the Union Army had occupied South Carolina Sea Islands, freeing, uh, freeing approximately 10,000 slaves. Uh, as the Confederate Army and white plantation owners fled, Northerns began to capitalize on their possession of an area world famous for its cotton. So in January 9, 1862, Union General William T. Sherman requested teachers from the North to train the ex-slaves that remained in, in that area. Um, and three months later, so this is in January 62, Three months later, U.S. Secretary of Treasury Salmon Chase appointed the Boston attorney Edward L. Pierce to begin the Port Royal experiment, which would create schools and hospitals for ex-slaves and to allow them to buy and run plantations. And that very same month, so uh, three months after the call of uh, in January, uh, that same month, the steamship Atlantic left New York City bound for Port Royal, and on board were 53 missionaries, including skilled teachers, ministers, and doctors who had volunteered to help promote this experiment. Um, I will discuss uh, uh, the 
the the phenomena of volunteerism um, uh, next. But uh, this was extraordinary, the response of the North to this, um, to this whole situation. So there were two confiscation acts uh, that were um, passed in the Congress, uh, the first one in August 1961 uh, and the second one in July 62. Um, so almost a year from, apart from each other. So there was a, a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of uh, debate around this. So um, early in '62, a group of moderate senators, led by Ohio Senator John Sherman, produced a compromise bill. So the famous Compromise Confiscation Act uh, was approved in July 1862, and it was a compromise bill. So this compromise bill established provisions for the emancipation of slaves in conquered rebel territory so that they could be fed. It prohibited the return of fugitive slaves. It confiscated Confederate properties in any district in insurrection through court action. So these large, uh, large um, um, holdings, plantation holdings were seized. And uh, it authorized to use Negroes in such a matter. And I'm using the text here from, um, if anybody gets offended by the word of the use of the word Negro, uh, I'm using a lot of the information here is from uh, um, the autobiography of uh, General O. o. Howard. And he used this phrasing, so I just, I thought the best since I used it in text to also use what he, what language he used. So uh, the authorization uh, was given to use Negroes in such a manner as the president should judge best for the public welfare in the suppression of the rebellion. However, this confiscation act lacked enforcement capabilities and it was very loosely enforced by the Lincoln administration. It was actively undermined by Lincoln's successor, Prince, President Andrew Johnson. And um, under this legislation, numerous colonies were organized along the sovereign coast uh, to help uh, the newly freed slaves. So um, the very next year, January 1st, 1863, President uh, Lincoln uh, issued the em Emancipation Proclamation um, he says that on the first day of January in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of the state, the people thereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforth and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act, act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. So this is a statue uh, that was very close to where we used to live in Washington, D.C. This is in Lincoln Park um, on the Capitol Hill side. Uh, I came across it um, one, I went for a walk. I remember I went for a walk on uh, January 1st, um, early in the morning, uh, and walked through Lincoln Park, and I saw this group of people standing by the Lincoln statue. So I kind of, being nosy, I went close to there to see what was going on. And um, they had actually uh, given speeches about Lincoln and the, and the whole uh, Emancipation Proclamation, and they also read the Emancipation Proclamation. And I found out that this happened every year. Every year, you would have uh, African Americans gather at the at this statue, and uh, and um, basically commemorate the Emancipation Pro Proclamation. Um, Jerry also told me that. Uh, the 
slave depicted here, uh, where the chains have been broken, uh, was the last fugitive slave. And it was, uh, uh, this image is a real image of, of that very person. The whole statue was actually financed by contributions from former slaves. So this is a description um, of, um, of the situation of the slaves. So from a newspaper, Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper, it was published in 1865. And in there it says, born slaves, they have lived slaves and have neither acted nor thought for themselves. With the exception of their full grown passions and physical strength, they are so many children and with some rare exception, no more fit to take immediate steps for themselves and their families than children are. If a wicked and lifelong system of terror has destroyed their veracity and implanted in them a cowardly habit of duplicity, the fault should be placed where it belongs, to their owners. And this uh, refers exactly what Jerry was referring to in the beginning in the introduction to this presentation. Um, imagine this, I mean, you have four and a half million slaves they have been. Uh, they have not uh, been allowed uh, to learn to read and write. Uh, they have always been told what to do. They have never. Uh, they were punished if they had their own uh, thoughts or ideas, um, because it was not the slave master's idea. Uh, so they. So now they're all of a sudden free. They have never fended for themselves. They have never made labor contracts for themselves. They have never um, figured out um, for themselves what, what the schedule should be. Uh, they have always followed orders. So yes, um, I'm sure there are very many exceptions uh, where people could fend for themselves right after emancipation, but the majority was like, were like children. And now they're free. So um, Edward L. Pierce, uh, the one that was put in charge of uh, the Port Royal, uh, the Port Royal experiment, he established the Freedmen's Aid Societies as private organizations. Um, and there are many of these um, Freedmen's Aid Societies in the United States. Meanwhile, the government enlisted able-bodied men as soldiers and laborers, and women and children were herded into central camps under guard for protection, uh, so, uh, so their land, so their owners couldn't come and get them. Um, centers uh, were established at Fortress Monroe, Washington, D.C., Beaufort and Port Royal, New Orleans, Vicksburg, Corinth, Columbus, Cairo, and many other places. So now um, the voluntarism I was talking about, which is very, I mean, this is incredible. I thought it was incredible thinking about this and how this nation, the northern, na northern part of the United States responded to this situation in the South. So Freedmen's Aid Societies were constituted of 50 or more active organizations. So you had all the different churches, um, you had the American Missionary Association, the National Freedmen's Relief Association, the American Freedmen's Union, Western Freedmen's Aid Commission, Methodist Freedmen's Association, Baptist Freedmen's Association, Catholic Freedmen's Association, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they all sent money, they sent clothes, they sent school books, they sent teachers southwards to help um, uh, the slaves, the freedmen. So this is a partial list from the autobiography of General Howard. Um, so they, all these different churches um, established their own freedmen's departments. And then in July 1864, a convention of freedmen's associations was held at Indianapolis to secure a concert of action, to figure out, so, to, so that everybody 
um, was on the same page. And they issued this convention, issued a petition to Lincoln to give a supervising agent for the West. Uh, so they wanted somebody in charge of the overall efforts. Um, so they, this person, they requested that this person should have military power and authority to overcome all controversy in the execution of this trust. So it became very quickly obvious that this was a national crisis. There was a labor problem of vast dimensions. You had masses of former slaves who stood idle, or if they worked periodically, they were never sure of pay. And if perchance they received pay, they squandered uh, the money thoughtlessly because they're not used to handling money. Uh, freedmen became demoralized. The office of the president received daily inquiries about what to do with the freedmen. Um, however, uh, because of what happened at Port Royal, the plan, this plan of leased plantations and guided workmen, pointed out a rough way on how to approach this. In Washington, the military governor, at the urging at the urgent appeal of the superintendent, opened confiscated estates to the cultivation of the fugitives. So the freedmen were able to use this land to have their own little farms to grow food and so forth. General Dix gave over estates to the freedmen of Fort Monroe, and so on. This happened throughout the South. <clears throat> the government and the benevolent societies furnished the means of cultivation and the Negroes um, returned again slowly to work. So this system of, so for example, so this is, so you, for example, General Banks down in Louisiana uh, oversaw uh oh, it says here my internet connection is unstable. General Banks in Louisiana oversaw 90,000 uh, black subject, subjects, 50,000 guided laborers, and had an annual budget of $100,000 or more. He'd made out 40,000 payrolls, registered all freedmen, inquired into grievances and re redressed them, laid and collected taxes, and established a system of public schools. So not only did General Banks do all this, but he also had to inquire into grievances, meaning that he had to play the court. Je Colonel Eaton, the superintendent of Tennessee and Arkansas, ruled over 100,000 freedmen, leased and cultivated 7,000 acres of cotton land and furnished food for 10,000 poor people. General Saxton in South Carolina sold forfeited uh, estates, leased abandoned plantations, encouraged schools, and re received from Sherman after the march to sea thousands of the camp followers that had followed Sherman's army. Um, don't forget that there was no more, uh, there were no more governments in the sovereign states. Um, yeah, I'm going ahead of the of the thing here. Okay, hold on. So directly after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued in uh, 1863, Representative T. Elliott of Massachusetts had introduced a bill creating a Bureau of Emancipation, but it was never uh, put in place. The following June, Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton created a Committee of Inquiry, which reported in favor of a temporary bureau for the improvement, protection, and employment of refugee freedmen. And petitions came in to President Lincoln from distinguished citizens and organizations, strongly urging a comprehensive and unified plan of dealing with the freedmen under a bureau which should be charged with the study of plans and execution of measures for easily guiding in every way, judiciously and humanely aiding the passage of our emancipated and yet to be emancipated blacks from the old condition of forced labor to their new state of voluntary industry. Laws of 1863 and 1864 directed treasury officials 
to take charge of and lease abandoned lands for periods not exceeding 12 months, so just one year, and to provide in such leases or otherwise for the employment and general welfare of the freedmen. Most of the army officers were look, looked upon this as a welcome relief from perplexing Negro affairs. Um, the Treasury Department hesitated and blundered. Finally, in March of 1864, the Congress turned its attention to the subject and the House passed a bill by a majority of two establishing a Bureau for Freedmen in the War Department. So until then, you had still complete chaos. Uh, in January, on January 16, 1865, William, uh, General William T. Sherman intervened in this, in this chaotic situation. He issued Special Field Order Number 15. Uh, in this special field order, it says he basically allocated the islands from Charleston South um, for the for the settlement of the Negroes. Okay, and he says in there, in the settlement hereafter to be established, no white person, whatever, unless military officers and soldiers detailed for duty, will be permitted to reside and the sole and exclusive management of affairs will be left to the people, freed people themselves, subject only to the United States military authority and the acts of Congress. By the laws of war and orders of the President of the United States, the Negro is free and must be dealt with as such. He cannot be subjected to conscription or forced military service, save by the written orders of the highest military authority of the department under such regulations as the President or Congress may prescribe. Domestic servants, blacksmiths, carpenters, and other mechanics will be free to select their own work and residence, but the young and able-bodied Negroes must be encouraged to enlist as soldiers in the service of the United States to contribute their share towards maintaining their own freedom and securing their rights as citizens of the United States. So, he issued this, this the war, the civil war is still going on. So this is the area, uh, 400,000 acres in Orange here, um, that uh, Sherman granted to 10,000 freed people in January 1865. January 31st, 1865. The Thirteenth Amendment was passed, okay, uh, which dealt with the abolishment of slavery. Just a little tiny bit later after Sherman did this. So, Congress, Congressman Thaddeus Stevens intervenes in this situation. Uh, Stevens proposed, remember, he is part of the radical Republicans. Um, he proposed to crush sovereign oligarchical power by confiscating their immense land holdings, providing land and economic independence for the newly freed blacks and poor whites of the South. This is what he says. Reformation must be affected. The foundation of their institutions, political, municipal, and social, must be broken up and relayed, or all our blood and treasure will have been spent in vain. Heretofore, sovereign society has had more the features of aristocracy than democracy. The sovereign states have been despotisms. It is impossible that any practical equality or right can exist where a few thousand men monopolize the whole landed property. How can Republican institutions, free schools, free churches, free social intercourse exist in a mingled community of nabobs and serfs, of owners of 20,000 acre manors with lordly palaces, and to occupants of narrow huts inhabited by low white trash. If the South is ever to be made a safe republic, let her land be cultivated by the toil of its owners or the free labor 
or intel of intelligent citizens. This must be done, even though it drives the nobility into exile. If they go, all the better. It is easier and more beneficial to exile 70,000 proud, bloated, and defiant rebels than to expatriate 4 million laborers, native to the soil and loyal to the government. So this is a, a, a speech he gave in Congress, and you can probably imagine what kind of reaction he got from that. So on March 3rd, 1865, Congress passed an act to establish a bureau for the relief of freedmen and refugees to provide food, shelter, clothing, medical services, provide land to displaced sovereigners, including newly freed African-Americans, establish schools, supervise contracts between freedmen and employers, manage confiscated or abandoned lands. The Freedmen's Bureau was to operate during the present war of rebellion and for one year thereafter. President Lincoln approved the Bureau Act, but delayed creating the organization authorized by it. Um, okay. So on April 9th, 1865, General Lee surrenders, and you see the picture here. He surrendered to um, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, on April 11, two days later, uh, was the last speech of President Lincoln. He mentions black suffrage for soldiers and discusses reconstruction, especially of Louisiana. And then four days later, uh, President Abraham Lincoln uh, gets assassinated. And Vice President Andrew Johnson, Southern Democrat, becomes president. Shortly before his death, Lincoln met with uh, Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War. They discussed this new bureau, um, Freedmen's Bureau, in his department. Uh, he discussed, Lincoln uh, discussed his wishes concerning the law and the officials who should carry it out. Mr. Stanton respected these wishes as a legacy and saw to it that they were fulfilled. So, and that's where uh, General Howard comes in. General Oliver Otis Howard was offered the job of Commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau on May 11, 1865 by Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Um, he was offered to use the house of a prominent senator who had joined the Confederacy as an office. So this, this house was confiscated as, uh, because it belonged to a, a, a Confederate. Um, and General Howard was 34 years old at the time. And uh, you might not see it from the picture, but he actually had lost an arm. So his right arm um, is... Uh, was uh, is not existent there. So this is a gigantic, as you can imagine, this is a gigantic job uh, for uh, General Howard. Also, although in his book he discusses already that uh, he was thinking, what am I going to do? The war is almost finished. What am I going to do? Or the war is finished. What am I going to do? What's my future? Okay, will I stay in the army? And so forth and so on. So uh, he got this offer. And after a couple of, or a day later, he decided to accept it. And when he um, came in to, to uh, Stanton and accepted the office, uh, um, Mr. Stanton gave him a bushel of filled to the top with letters and documents and stuff regarding to the bureau and said, here is your bureau, okay? And so uh, General Howard had to sort through this mess of documents to figure out what was happening. Um, General Howard set up a home office with different, uh, with uh, either camps and, uh, and uh, other people. Um, as you can see some of the names here. He also set up 12 assistant field commissioners. Um, and you can see the little yellow, the white circles uh, that I put in there. 
um, this is where they were located. And uh, the people that he had assigned to these areas, although some of the names changed around. Um, the one that is not listed on the map is the one in Texas there. Uh, General Gregory, who was setting up um, in Galveston, Texas. So, um, okay. President Andrew Johnson announced his plan for presidential reconstruction in May 1865. So this is not the same as the Freedmen's Bureau, okay? He calls for general amnesty for Confederate soldiers. He calls for restoration of property, except for slaves, to all sovereigns who will swear loyalty to the Union. So all these um, plantations that Sherman has been giving away and, and so forth, um, they are going to be returned to Confederates, former Confederates or Confederate um, supporters, um, if they uh, swore allegiance to the United States. Um, large landowners of the South and the Confederate leadership will be required to petition him individually for pardons, and also the states need to ratify the 13th Amendment ending slavery. To be readmitted to the Union, uh, the states had to ratify the 13th Amendment. So that, I guess that was one good thing. So less than a year after Sherman's field order number 15, President Andrew Johnson intervened and ordered that the vast majority of confiscated land be returned to its former owners. This included most of the land that the freedmen had settled. So imagine this now. Um, you had uh, freedmen who now have been working the fields, who have been planting the crops, okay, um, and preparing the fields and getting them ready and doing all the things that you need to do. And now all of a sudden, uh, this land that they had been working has now been returned uh, to the former owners. So the federal government dispossessed tens of thousands of black landholders. In Georgia and South Carolina, some blacks fought back, driving away former owners with guns. And sometimes federal troops had to convict, evict, I'm sorry, evict blacks by force from, from this land. So uh, this is the organization of the Freedmen's Bureau. So you had uh, the, um, I have to move this thing here, Division of Records, the Land Division that dealt with abandoned lands and confiscated lands. Uh, you had Financial Affairs, you had a, a big medical division that needed to um, deal with uh, uh, hospitals and asylums for refugees and freedmen and orphans. And you had uh, commissary supplies, you had the quartermaster supplies. Uh, the quartermaster was sending freedmen and refugees to places where labor has been found for them. So they were basically um, giving or saying, this is there's a job for you, go over there. You don't have money to get there. Okay, here's money to get you to that, uh, to that place. Massive, massive undertaking here. So uh, May 15th, 1865, uh, Howard, General Howard, introduces himself as Commissioner of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. He appoints eight assistant commissioners, outlines their duties. He orders that all cultivated uh, land cultivated by freedmen be retained in the processions until growing crops could be secured for their benefits. So in other words, what he's saying, okay, you can kick off uh, these former slaves of the uh, of this land. They had they have cultivated it. They had planted the seeds. They have done what uh, is necessary. You can kick them off now. You um, the the crops that will be harvested will be theirs. The benefit, the 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 the, the money gained from these crops that they have tended till now will be secured for their benefit. 
So that was a very important uh, thing to do. Um, the assistant commis commissioners were to quicken and uh, to direct the industry of the refugees and freemen to prevent starvation and suffering, promote good order and prosperity. And uh, this particular uh, announcement was approved by President Johnson uh, on, on June 2nd, 1865. And then later on in September, he announced three more assistant commissioners. So these are the duties of the assistant commissioners who were down in those different locations. Um, now also remember, uh, most of these orders that uh, General Howard issued, they were uh, they were sent by by mail or delivered by messengers. Okay, uh, there was no cell phones or telephones back then, so. Um, the duties were supervision of abandoned lands, control of subjects leading to refugees and freedmen, receive reports on condition of their work from all agents, i.e. from military officers, treasury department officers, of voluntary society officers. So these assistant commissions were kind of overseeing uh, the efforts of all these different um, um, people who worked uh, for the benefits of the refugees and freedmen. They had to introduce a practical system of compens compensated labor. They had to remove prejudices from their late masters who were unwilling to employ their former servants. Um, they had to work to correct false impressions that freedmen could live without labor because some freedmen did think that, that, okay, now my uh, my uh, time of work is over. Um, uh, they were to encourage or if necessary, compel the able body to labor for their own support. Wholesome compuls compulsion eventuated in larger independence. They were supposed to provide for the aged, unfirm and sick, and they were also in charge of maintenance of good schools. Um, Quite a list of things to do for these assistant commissioners who were, um, I might also say, looked at, uh, not favorably looked at by the former Confederate population in those locations where they were sent to. They were considered to be part of the North. And as such, were not, um, not so eagerly um, welcomed. So uh, there was the first controversy, which was the issue of uh, labor. Um, there was the first le letter issued by General Howard uh, in 65. He said, while it shall be my object to secure as much uniformity as possible in the matter of employment and instruction of the freedmen, I earnestly solicit cooperation from all officers and agents whose position or duty renders it possible for them to aid me. The Negro should understand that he is really free, but on no account, if able to work, should he harbor the thought that the government will support him in idleness. So right away, we had these uh, radical newspapers who were friendly towards the Negro who said, well, the Negro has just changed masters from the sovereign slave owners to the United States. Now the United States is the new master. Uh, they implied that the government should support the emancipation and emancipated even if they were idle. Uh, but then on the other hand, the enemies of free labor approved all of Howard's compulsory language. So okay, as you can imagine, uh, everything Howard did, because this was a big issue all throughout the United States, any step that he took was um, was very, very, very closely uh, looked at. Uh, military authorities were feeding immense groups of refugees and freedmen in Washington and vicinity, as well as in the different parts of the South and West. Uh, in May 1865, 144,000 daily rations were issued, uh, mainly food, okay? Uh, August 1865, 148,000 daily rations. 
And then this was reduced, okay? In September, uh, it was down to 70, almost 75,000 daily ra ra rations. And this was due to a, a rigid uh, em em examination of every applicant. Uh, so you had to apply to get a, 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 ra a ration. And um, uh, if you could support yourselves by labor, then you were rejected. Um, and uh, what they also did, uh, these assistant commissioners, they helped uh, the process um, by finding work for the willing. And there was a constant reduction from then on um, in, um, in uh, issuing ra uh, rations. Rations. So due to the almost universal disturbance of labor through 11 or 12 states by the war and consequent emancipation, the industry was in complete chaos. Um, assistant commissioners were urged to use every proper means to quicken the industries in the states under their charge. Negroes were free to choose employers and receive pay for their labor. The old system of overseers was ab abolished. Cruelty and oppression were to be suppressed. Uh, letters poured in to urge General Howard to fix prices and to enable employers to exercise power over the laborer. The majority did not believe that the Negro would work unless under compulsion. Howard insisted that the wages must be free. Uh, he said that the wages must be regulated by the assent of both parties to a verbal or written contract or adjusted by common market value. He cautioned the assistant commissioners against any substitute whatever for slavery. Um, he said the wages should be regulated by demand and agreement. And uh, I guess they tried it out. They found that the minimum wages, if they had established minimum wages when published, they sometimes protected the freedmen, but it was very difficult once you had published minimum wages to ever advance above the minimum. I guess it's still this kind of like today still. <laughs> so, um, um, so the uh, so the the if the rates were fixed for able-bodied men, you did not properly discriminate with regard to differences of skill and ability in a given class. So, if you had a skilled carpenter and you had minimum wage, he was paid minimum wage, the same as somebody who was uh, totally unskilled. And that's why Howard from the beginning said that the wages must be free, there should be no limit, there should be no minimum wage, because otherwise uh, there's no, never gonna be um, a, a rising of the wages. So then also what had to be done is uh, the justice system had completely, uh, was completely interrupted. Um, and then he uh, put in um, uh, advisement on this. He says, in all places where there is an interruption of civil law or in which local courts, by reason of old courts, in violation of the freedom guaranteed by the proclamation of the president and the laws of Congress, Disregard the Negro's right to justice before the laws in not allowing him to give testimony. The control of all subjects relating, relating to refugees and freedmen being committed to this bureau, the assistant commissioners will educate either themselves or through officers of their appointments, all difficulties arising between Negroes and whites or Indians, except those in military service so far as recognizable by military authority and not taking cognizance of by off by other tribunals, civil or military of the United States. So now the uh, assistant commissioners were also um, running court systems. So the priority was to um, obtain the recognition of the Negro as a man instead of a chattel before the civil and criminal courts. And the Freedmen's Bureau led led the way in influencing the South in its transi transition into the new order of things. They organized minor courts. Uh, government uh, was represented by Freedmen's Bureau personnel. The planters uh, represented uh, by elected choice. 
and the freedmen themselves are represented by representatives of his choice. So nine cases out of 10, the freedmen will choose an intelligent white man who has always seemed to be their friend to represent uh, his interest. So in that way, everyone's interest will be fairly represented and the punishment was limited to not exceed $100 as fines or 30 days imprisonment. And the lesser uh, bureau courts were often necessary for the protection of Negroes against small personal persecutions and the hostility of white juries. Uh, remember, just because um, slaves were emancipated doesn't mean that all of a sudden their former, uh, their former uh, owners were now um, friendly disposed, uh, disposed friendly towards them. All cases of capital crimes, felonies, or questions relating to titles to real estate were referred to state court, if such existed, that a case occurred, or to a court of the United States or to military commissioners. The higher courts of the state did not admit the testimony of black people at that point. Uh, so provost courts, uh, a military substitute for civil courts in unoccupied territory were established, as soon as the military occupation of the South had been completed. So another area was the medical services, okay. Uh, in June uh, 1865, Surgeon Caleb Horner became medical director for the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, at first, the medical work was done in a very irregular way. There were no, there were no rules um, whatsoever. And then uh, in August uh, 1865, uh, Surgeon General of the United States, Barnes, uh, he directed that uh, there was, uh, 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 that there would uh, be medical and hospital supplies issued to the medical to the freedmen's medical officers, and which was very, very good. Uh, Surgeon Horner had 17 medical assistants by the middle of August 1865. And that covered, these 17 medical assistants covered the whole territory from Maryland to Louisiana. By November okay, 1865, um, Howard reported that although the Bureau has not yet reached the remote sections of the South, already 42 hospitals with accommodations for 4,500 patients are in operation and facilities are afforded for the treatment of 5,000 sick in 24 asylums and established colonies. 83 physicians, 180 male and 177 female attendants were employed by contract. So pretty impressive to have done all of this in this very, very, very short time. By December 1865, the following figures were reported. Uh, Two and a half thousand white refugees received medical treatment. Forty-five thousand freedmen received medical treatment. In the hospitals, you had three hundred eighty-eight refugees. You had six thousand six hundred forty-five freedmen. Uh, the percentage of deaths was unusually large, uh, due to hardship uh, previously suffered. And 9% um, of white refugees died, 13% of freedmen died. Uh, but before you had the systematic medical aid, um, freedmen, freedmen were dying at a rate of 30%. When the intervention happened by the Bureau, by the Freedmen's Bureau, this was reduced to less than 4%. So a dramatic reduction. The other, uh, the other um area that the Freedman was in charge, Freedman Spirit was in charge of was orphans. Uh, and General Howard in his bio autobiography says, by the breaking up of the slave system, former owners were of course freed from the care of Negro children. And there having been in much of the South a want of any permanent family relation among the slaves, hosts of Negro children without parents of friend, or friends were found in sovereign cities. So it just, it just blows your mind thinking about this, right? Because the slavery system regularly sold children away from their families. 
uh, or took the parents apart from each other, away from each other. Or, you know, if, uh, if um, the slave family had children, uh, the children were sold in all different uh, directions of the, of, of, of the South, never to see each other again. So uh, here they are fending for themselves now because the former owners did. It's emancipation. Yeah, I don't have to care for these children anymore. So the Freedmen's Bureau was in charge of establishing orphan asylums. So, for example, in Washington, D.C., you had um, uh, a ladies' uh, benevol benevolent society who established the National Association for the Relief of Destitute Colored Women and Children. And in Washington, D.C., at that location, they cared for 100 to 200 children during 1865. Now, this is pretty, there's a funny story involved in this. Um, so uh, they had been assigned by the Freedmen's Bureau uh, uh, um, a, a, a plantation or a manor, I should say, uh, of a former Confederate um, who has lost the manor because of him being part of the Confederacy, his uh, property was confiscated and given to these ladies to so that they could run their, their orphan. But then, of course, uh, Andrew Johnson uh, pardoned this guy. And then Mr. Howard had to go, General Howard had to go and tell the ladies that they had to leave the orphan, the premises there, because uh, this, uh, this fellow, Mr. Cox, was getting his property back. And so they had to leave, and the Freedmen's uh, Bureau had to set up a new location for them. Um, Mr. Cox, uh, just to show his vindictiveness, uh, tried to sue sue the ladies of the Benevolent Society uh, to the tune of ten thousand uh, dollars uh, because of damage that they had done to his property. And he was uh, fortunately he was uh, unsuccessful in that. So um, just a, how the, a little uh, anecdote on the things that happened. In New Orleans, you had three orphan asylums. One had 100 children, one had 60 to 70 girls. Another one had 150 orphans. Um, Louisiana had two more. The state of Louisiana had two more asylums. One was supported by the government, one by the colored people themselves. So then the Freedmen's Bureau united them and put them under the management of the National Freedmen's Association. Uh, also, one of the things that um, the Freedmen's Bureau was in charge of was schools. And here you see a map of historically black colleges and universities that came out of the Freedmen's Bureau's efforts. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, by the way, uh, Howard University in Washington, D.C., when I lived there, I always thought that Howard University was named after uh, a black guy. And uh, now I find out, no, it's because of uh, General uh, Howard. It was named after him because also he was one of the main um, uh, organizers and financial contributors and uh, he was ra uh, raising a lot of money to establish that university. So, uh, and throughout the South, you actually found quite a number of these uh, schools and universities that were named after uh, Friedman's uh, Bureau's um, assistant commissioners. So, um, so all of these things are happening. The Freedmen's Bureau is working really, really, really hard uh, to help the newly freed uh, slaves. However, of course, in the South, they're not happy with this. Um, so now you have uh, something called the Black Codes. And the Black Codes were basically rules that were applied only to persons of color um, to try to to uh, reverse all the gains that have been made by the Freedmen's Bureau and uh, through the different uh, laws and so forth, okay? So um, so the South Carolina, South Carolina and Missouri were the two states that had really, were really bad with the black coats. Um, they were applied to only persons of color. They were defined as 
uh, you were a person of color if you had uh, if you had more than one eighth of Negro blood. So black codes addressed everything. They addressed civil rights. They addressed labor contracts, vacancy, apprenticeship, courts, crimes, punishments, and other restrictions. Okay. So for example, a marriage between a white person and a, a person of color shall be illegal and void. That was one of the rules. Was the black codes. Um, they uh, there was a written contract form for black servants who agreed to work for white masters. The form required that the wages and the term of service be in writing, and the contract had to be witnessed and then approved by a judge. And of course, if you had a corrupt judge, okay, a pro Confederate judge, uh, these contracts could be really, really slanted towards the towards the white masters, okay? Uh, black servants had to reside on the employer's property, remain quiet and orderly, work from sunup to sunset except on Sundays, and not leave the premises or receive visitors without the master's permission. Servants who quit before the end date of the labor contract forfeited their wages and could be arrested and return to their masters by a judge's order. Masters could moderately, whatever that means, whip servants under 18 to discipline them. And all sovereign black codes relied on vacancy laws to pressure freedmen to sign labor contracts. So this is how it works, okay? Uh, you don't have a labor contract? Oh, you must be a vagrant then. Oh, therefore, sign this contract because otherwise we'll put you in jail. So the South Carolina Code authorized courts to apprentice black orphans and the children of vagrants or other destitute parents, even against their will, to an employer until 21 years of age for males and 18 for females. So these are the black codes. These are attempts to reverse uh, everything done uh, by the Freedmen's Bureau and by President Lincoln and so forth, okay, and by the Freedmen's Associations and, and etc. South Carolina's um, Black Code established a racially separate court system for all civil and criminal cases that involved a Black plaintiff or a defendant. It only allowed Black witnesses to testify in court, but only in cases when you had when the case affected a person or property of a person of color. So if it was between blacks, okay, then you could testify, okay? Uh, crimes that the whites believed Friedman might commit, such as rebellion, arson, burglary, and assaulting a white woman car carried harsh penalties. Most of these crimes carried the death penalty for blacks, but not for whites. It banned black people from possessing most firearms, making or selling liquor, coming into the state without first posting a bond for good behavior. The code made it illegal for them to sell any farm products without written permission from their white employers, supposedly to guard against stealing. Also, blacks could not practice any occupation except farmer or servant under contract without getting an annual license from a judge. Again, okay, uh, hopefully, uh, the charge is not corrupt. So, um, Andrew Jackson, as president, exerted a powerful influence over the reconstruction of the sovereign states. And he openly advised sovereign opponents of congressional reconstruction to disobey obey, impede and resist the law of the land as embodied in the acts of Congress related to reconstructions. Such advice was not only criminal, but tended to fuel the process started by his own pro-Confederate policy in 1865 to 66, feeding the fires of insurrection in the South initiated by the Ku Klux Klan. His role as commander-in-chief and his control of patronage still allowed him to determine who would be the federal officials in not only the South, 
but in the rest of the nation as well. Johnson exercised that power to remove en masse appointees allied with his congressional opponents. By 1867, he had also removed every military commander in the South and replaced them with officers hostile to Congress and the Reconstruction Acts. So, okay, all this led to the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson. Okay, so uh, this is a quote from Representative William um, Pig Iron Kelly uh, calling for the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. He said, Sir, the bloody and untilled fields of the 10 unreconstructed states, the unsheeted ghosts of the 2,000 murdered Negroes in Texas, cry for the punishment of Andrew Johnson. So with Johnson clinging to the free trade policies that would dismantle the nation's economy and continuing in his criminal obstruction of Congress on reconstructions, those allied with Henry Carey decided it was time to be rid of Johnson once and for all. The very first calls for impeachment came from the business and manufacturing layers allied with Carey and with which such congressmen as Stevens and Kelly and senators such as Wade agreed. Um, E.B. Ward and his Iron and Steel Association, along with George Wilkes, editor of the influential magazine Wilkes Spirits of the Ages, in early 1867, after Johnson's veto of the Civil Rights and Freedmen's Bureau bills and his call for rejection of the 14th Amendment, first raised the call for Johnson's impeachment. Thaddeus Stevens had adamantly opposed the use of the Tenure of Office Act as grounds for impeachment and had drafted his own articles for impeachment, which he unsuccessfully fought to put through as the basis for Johnson's indictment. Stevens and his allies continued to focus on the simple reality of Johnson's real crimes in obstructing Congress as the reasons for impeachment. Stevens reiterated again and again that the core of Johnson's malfeasance was his commitment to policies contrary to the legislatively mandated policies of Congress and thus the law of the land and the dangerously destructive character of this fact for the nation's future and well-being. So um, there were really three factions in Congress. There was, there was the faction allied with the radical Republicans like Stevens and Kelly and uh, in the Senate Wade, okay? Uh, and then on the other hand, you had uh, the pro-British free trade, uh, pro-Confederacy faction. And then you had the middle ground. And this is where the battle was happening. Uh, everybody was fighting over the middle ground of the people who were sitting on the fence um, to get their vote. Uh, in the uh, impeachment proceedings. And um, in this way, um, so Stevens fought to have the proceedings premised on a higher legal, constitutional, and political ground. Uh, so there was a huge battle over these votes, and deals were made left and right. And on May 26, 1868, the trial concluded with a vote of 35 to 19, one vote short of the two-thirds majority required to acquit Andrew Johnson. So he stayed, uh, he was not impeached. They fell short of one vote. And this is a picture, okay? I don't know if you can see the gallery up here uh, on, the, on the top, full of people witnessing this. This is the very first impeachment trial in the history of the United States. By the way, if Johnson, okay, one of the reasons why uh, the votes failed, uh, if Johnson would have been impeached, Senator Wade would have become, because he was the Speaker of the House, he would have become uh, the president. And, uh, and he was part of the ra radical Republicans. 
and uh, a number of the, of course, the Southern faction, the pro-Confederate faction, pro-British faction, they knew that they had to, to stop this from under all circumstances from happening. Uh, and they, what they, they, what they call it, they, they waved the bloody shirt. Okay. Um, talking about all the different things, all the terrible, terrible, terrible things that would happen if uh, Senator Wade would become president. Um, and I'm sure that turned some of the votes in this impeachment uh, proceedings. So uh, July 19th, uh, 9th, 1868, okay, uh, the citizenship uh, clause, uh, the 14th Amendment was passed. Um, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, okay, are citizens of the United States. So that was very, very important because that made um, blacks now citizens. That means you could vote. So President Johnson was as dead politically as one could possibly be. He wasn't even he wasn't even nominated for president by his own Democratic Party after that impeachment. Okay, and uh, this is pretty much his last um, address to Congress uh, on December eighth, eighteen sixty eight. And I just highlighted here a little bit of his speech. It's a long speech, but I it just shows it just shows the attitude. Okay, um, and I read it: the attempt to place the white population under domination of persons of color in the South has impaired, if not destroyed, the kindly relations that have previously existed between them, <laughs> and mutual distrust has engendered a feeling of animosity which leading in some instances to collision and bloodshed, has prevented that cooperation between the two races so essential to the success of industrial enterprise in the sovereign states. So, okay, General Ulysses S. Grant was elected President of the United States on March 4, 1869. Okay, uh, of course, uh, we know um, General Grant us being uh, a Union general who um, uh, who led the Union armies to victory over the Confederacy in the American Civil War. Uh, and he became president and state president in 1877 to working to implement congressional reconstruction and to remove the vestiges of slavery. The 15th Amendment, voting rights, okay, was passed on February 26th, uh, 1870. So within a five year period, you had three amendments to the US Constitution, which is quite extraordinary. And these are the first African Americans elected to the House of Representatives on October 19th, 1870, the first African Americans were elected to the House of Representatives. Black Republicans won three of the four congressional seats in South Carolina. And here you see some of them. Um, okay. So this is uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, we have come a long way from, um, from the Emancipation Proclamation all the way through having seated um, people in the House uh, of Congress. So, so I'm uh, opening up for questions, okay? I know I've been a two to the force here a little bit. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much, Madeline. That was uh, uh, that was an excellent, excellent idea of the whole because Emancipation Proclamation didn't really end the fight for freedom. That's where the fight began. Yeah, you really see the fight between those people in the uh, Freedmen's Bureau versus. You know, I mean, they were up against the president, the new president, Andrew Johnson, who was totally opposed to that. And it's you really see the political fight that had to take place 
and also among the population, both the people who responded to the Freedmen's Bureau, but um, just being able to support the fight for emancipation, including in the South, too, because it was a lot of the whites who, uh, in the South, they called them refugees also, who benefit, benefited from Reconstruction. So if anyone has any questions, just put your name in the uh, chat chat box, chat room. I'll look and uh, see if there's any. I just wanted to mention that one, the statue of Lincoln and the freed slave that is in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. The, the freed slave... Uh, it, I think it was in St. Louis where they first um, began raising money for a monument for this. And uh, there was a fella in St. Louis, I think it's Archer Alexander, I think was his name. And he had, uh, try, he had escaped from slavery. This was in Missouri, but he was caught and he was ordered to be returned to his uh, slave owner. And shortly after that came the Emancipation Proclamation. So he was considered to be the last slave who was returned to his owner under the Fugitive Slave Act. And the people who were raising money for this monument, and they knew the person who was making it, got him to actually model the face of that freed slave in the statue is actually the face of Archer Alexander. It's a, so there's a real historical connection to that statue that um, I learned about too in, in Washington, D.C. from people who were there at the statue telling me that story. Yeah. Can you uh, look at the chat, Jerry, and then uh, just call the people's names? So there are a few, a few people who, okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, we have a question. There's a number of them. Yeah. Harinder Jadwani. Oh, that's the last question? one. That's the last one. Go up, scroll up, Jerry, and see who came first. Well, yeah, I think I was the first one, but anyway. Yeah, he oh, was the first one. The rest are just thanking you, Madeline. For oh, that. okay. <laughs> Harinder, go ahead with your question, please. So are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So the question that I've got is that this presentation focuses on the impeachment of uh, President Johnson. But it, despite his removal, my understanding is that Jim Crow laws continue to be put in place which and which effectively decimated whatever theoretical freedoms had been won. And uh, so can you just comment on... Uh, so there was a there was a, it wasn't just one individual. There was a whole, uh, you know, yeah, no system of actually, thought on that, right? Yeah, I, my, my intention was about the presentation was uh, actually to report more about the bureau, the Freedmen's Bureau, okay, and how this um, how this organization of dealing with uh, four and a half million of newly freed slaves, how that how how this came about and how this was organized because as a teacher it always interests me and in how you organize things like that i mean this is a massive massive effort okay uh to um to uh, address the situation right and uh so that was my intention okay and the yes the impeachment of andrew johnson you could the uh, give another presentation just on that Okay, I kind of went very roughly over that. Okay, you're absolutely right. Jim Crow laws did continue to exist. Okay, uh, mainly because you had this, um, um, you had um, some of the faults that Andrew Johnson did. He he accepted uh, the so-called people applying for a pardon and he would give them a pardon regardless of what they had done uh, in the South. And so he was very lenient towards people and 
basically the same people that have been put out went back into offices and got their offices. Um, so they had to find the Jim Crow's laws and the black codes were means to get around the laws that have that the government had put in place. Uh, and they took they stayed there for a long, long, long time. I mean, think, think about just you know uh, with Martin Luther King. I mean, and so forth. That was the civil rights movement was fighting against Jim Crow laws. Absolutely, there's no doubt about this. This was not. Um, um, this was not, everything was not hunky-dory after, after, uh, after the Freedmen's Bureau was there. Uh, but it was an attempt to deal with the situation immediately after the on that, uh, on that, uh, may, I, may I ask one or two more questions following what you just said? Yeah. So from what I've read elsewhere, it, this uh, civil war was presented as, as being, um, around the question of slavery, but in fact, it was around uh, economic uh, competition between the Northern states, which were relatively free of slavery and the Southern states, which are heavily profiting from slavery. And slavery, uh, blacks rights became just a pretext to disguise that real economic competition. And so therefore the freedmen's uh, organizations and all had that kind of motivation to behind it. So if you, uh, if you just have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, in the beginning of my presentation, I was making it, hopefully, I was hoping I was making it clear. I missed um, a few minutes. I'm sorry yeah, about that. That's okay. Okay. Uh, that this was definitely, it was a fight. Okay. It was a fight. Hold on a second. Let me see here. Okay. Hold on. Yes, okay. So um, that the reconstruction of the South was viewed as an economic, political, and social back, back, uh, battleground. Um, so the idea was reconstruction was a means to eliminate the influence and control of British power in America. That's what the radical Republicans uh, were very, very, very clear about. Uh, this faction here, okay, of uh, Henry Carey, Okay, Thaddeo Stevens, Stephen Colwell, um, uh, Congressman Kelly, uh, Senator Wade from Ohio, okay, um, uh, people were very clear that this is not about slavery in itself, okay, but that this is a battle to fight the importance, the, the, um, the, uh, the hand, the handle that the British system uh, the pro-British allies had over the United States. And that is that this whole battle now would be, um, would help to get rid of these people, would get rid of uh, the British influence of, uh, in the United States. So, which was in the South, which was in the South. It was in the South, but it wasn't just the South. They also have New York financial interests and Boston financial interests. Right. And because uh, this was a major, I mean, this was the, the raw cotton was thousands of dollars worth of, of material, raw materials, okay, that were sent overseas to be processed. And then it came back in the goods. And then you had to buy the goods, of course, much more expensive uh, than, uh, than if, you, uh, if you had done it yourself. Right. So this was a, a major um, financial undertaking, and uh, um, and that's what the, that's what the British Empire politics was always about. Um, wherever British Empire was, they would take advantage of the raw materials of a particular country and make that bring it back to their own place, okay, and control countries that way, right? And uh, Kelly and Stevens and, and, and these radical Republicans knew absolutely that this was the battle, that this reconstruction effort, that the whole civil war was the battle of kicking these people out once and for all. And unfortunately, they did not, did not succeed. Thank you. But they put up a hell of a fight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that question, Erinda. I think next we can go to Satomi. You have a question for Magdalena? 
Oh, yeah, thank you. Gosh, Magdalena, you, it's just so great to see how, you know, that whole reconstruction, what it really involved. You know, we, we don't think about that. We just think yeah. about oh, the, the war is over. Yeah, yeah. But yes, and, and um, but that education is so important. Really, what, what you know, um, the Freedmen Bureau, I think, was such a pivotal point. But, I mean, the, there's so much similarities to today. Do you, you know, find that or do you find it's not totally like no. what we're going through today? Ab absolutely. That's why I was curious about this whole situation, right? How did this actually was, how was this organized? I mean, think about this. You have four and a half million people coming out of slavery. They can't read and write. Okay, now all of a sudden they're supposed to fend for themselves. They all of a sudden they're supposed to make labor contracts, but they can't read. Right? They can't even nobody has taught them how do you figure out, you know, how do you create profit, even if you were a skilled laborer like an, a carpenter, okay? How do you figure out how to make a profit? Yeah. You don't know. You don't know any of these things. Right. And so for the Freedmen's Bureau to come in there and represent the interests of the freedmen. OK, that was absolutely crucial. It was so, so, so important. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, uh, there were some people in the Freedmen's Bureau that were OK, corrupted because of their surroundings in the South. OK, uh, because they didn't like uh, some you know, I mean, think about it. You were sent down there as a, a as an agent of the government, as an agent of the North, as an agent to represent the freedmen. Okay, and you have around you a lot of hostility. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you had to deal with that, right? And some people could hack it, and some people couldn't, right? Yeah, yeah. Like well, it's interesting how the military play quite an important role absolutely yeah and this is and this is also a part right because the military had the means to do this okay there was nobody else so that's why you had you had all these freedmen's associations which were coming from civil society okay from you know church ladies and 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 different churches and different organizations and and they and they rightly inquired of President uh, Lincoln, we need to have a person who is in charge for the overall effort because we're just, you know, we're just falling over each other. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it, it, this was necessary to establish the Freedmen's Bureau. There was, this is another thing when I was doing the research for the presentation, I was so impressed by the volunteerism. Yes. I was so impressed by people, by all these people from everywhere in the North, and in, not even in the North, all over the world, okay, um, contributing, helping um, with money, with goods, okay, with their own expertise uh, to come uh, to the South and to help, right? And I thought, my goodness, if we had that kind of initiative and volunteerism nowadays, what could we do? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's happening. You know, the, the an awakening is is happening, and it's really encouraging. And so, it's so good to know, like the strategies that you can still implement today that was being implemented then. I, I think you know the basic framework. I think is really just excellent. Well, thank you so much, Magdalena. I learned so much. Thank you. So I'm glad you brought up that bit about the U.S. Army, Satomi, so because I was I was always reminded by Anton Chaikin, who said, "Well, the Emancipation Proclamation was a piece of paper. The slaves were freed by the U.S. Army. That's who did it. I mean, even Sherman, forty forty acres and a mule. That was his policy." the U.S. Army, and you look at the Freedmen's Bureau, not just General Howard, but all of his assistants and everything, they were all people from the Army that ran that. It's very important. Okay, we have next question from Paul. Paul, are you there? 
I, can I just interrupt you quickly before we do that? Because you said something just now that uh, I wanted to, <laughs> to address. Um, <laughs> uh, the 40 acres and a mule story, okay? Um, it was very interesting because that was actually a rumor. And um, I think it was around before Christmas time, or the fall of 1865 or so, okay, I believe, if I remember this correctly, okay, um, there was a rumor going around that uh, Friedman would all receive 40 acres and a mule, okay? Now, the problem was this, um, it was a rumor. And what happened is because people believed the rumor, uh, they would refuse, Friedman would refuse to enter into labor contracts at that point, because around Christmas time is when people made labor contracts for the next year, okay? And because of that, they, there, was, uh, there was very big complaints to General Howard that the Friedman were refusing to enter labor contracts because they were all waiting for their 40 acres and their mule. Um, and so uh, General Howard had to give out a directive to his assistant commissioners telling them, you have to make sure you, you, you make a firm stand, this is not going to happen. And you encourage the freedmen to enter into labor contracts for the next year, uh, because this is uh, very, very uh, detrimental to their well-being if they have they're not going to get the 40 acres and the mule and uh, and they need to have labor contracts. Anyway, so that's what, what came up when you said that. Okay. All right, Paul, if you're there, uh, you have the next question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much. It's fascinating. Um, I would just, so Tommy basically touched on what I was asking, but I would just uh, sort of um, like you to emphasize there, what is your... Um, impression because you've had your hands in you know been digging around in this so much what are the lessons learned what did you what do you think could, we could learn from this chapter of this re, re, re repeating story or confrontation confrontation oh boy <laughs> that's a good question um i mean the the thing was <sighs> President Lincoln was definitely helping, okay? Although he has, sometimes he took his time. And sometimes I think he took his time because he didn't quite have the support that he needed to push things through, okay? Um, the unfortunate thing he had is that his vice president was Andrew Johnson and he was a sovereign Democrat. And that was a compromise that he had to do, Lincoln had to do, okay? To get the presidency, so okay, and then it kicked him. It kicked him in the rear end, right? This is this is the problem. Okay, you do these compromises, and then you have. So Lincoln got shot, and Andrew Johnson became president, and of course Andrew Johnson right away, actually not quite right away, but within one two months of becoming president, he started reversing things uh in in favor of the sovereign so yeah compromises they might come and bite you you know in the end um anything jerry do you want to say something do you have something to do to say on this no not really that's uh that's about it it's just it's and it's the other thing is the whole, yeah he, he, uh, it's Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, Thaddeus Stevens and, and Henry Carey, they made it very clear. Thaddeus Stevens, I mean, that speech that I wrote there, that I read there, uh, where you talked about the 70,000 uh, uh, plantation owners, and it would be much better to get rid of them. Okay. Good riddance, in other words. Okay. Uh, I mean, he was blunt. He was blunt. Uh, and there was a, 
you know, and you have to always think about, I mean, how the Congress itself was divided up into these factions. You had the radical Republicans on the one side, okay, with uh, with uh, with Stevens and Kelly and Wade and so forth, okay. And also, by the way, there were also other people outside of the Congress, like uh, this guy Stephen Caldwell, um, who was uh, who wrote on economics and he wrote on religion, okay. He was a big friend of um, uh, of uh, of Kerry. Kerry actually wrote a, 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 wrote an obituary for him, which was a many page long obituary. Um, so there are other people outside of Congress who are also collaborating with the radical Republicans. Okay, but then you had a, a big a big following of the pro British faction, and then okay. And with the impeachment of Andrew Jackson, uh, Ch Johnson, sorry, <laughs> Johnson, you had this middle faction, okay, um, in Congress who were basically evading where the wind was blowing from, okay, what was advantageous for them. And they made deals, okay. And that is, I think, where even today we can learn our lessons uh, about. And we have middle factions too. I mean, every society has them always, right? The fence sitters, the, the people who want to see what is for their advantage or not. Um, that's where um, I think a much more effort in terms of educating these people should have taken place. But the consequences of their inaction or their, uh, their views, okay? And um, I think that's where that's where Stevens um, and these people, although they did a lot, they did a lot of uh, writing, they did a lot of pamphleteering. Okay, they put a lot of material out there to inform on the issue. But I think they they should have done a little bit more of that personally or directly to to these people that are sitting on the fence. So that's just me, uh, you know. I'm. It's always good to say those things in in hindsight, right? <laughs> and I think also what I was going to say is that, in terms of what you mentioned, the propaganda war and what Harinda Harinda touched on too, that the the fight against slavery should be seen as part of the overall economic and political fight. And Madeline, Madeline Magdalena, you mentioned it earlier to me that a whole other class could be given on Henry Carey and Colwell and Thaddeus Stephen and the work they did to educate the population, the the propaganda war, the pamphlet war. And I just wanted to mention that Henry Carey wrote a book, I think it was in 1850, but it was How to End Slavery. And he went through the whole horrors of slavery and the economics of it. But his simple solution was that if you industrialize the South, the way you would end slavery is that you have to raise the value of man. Mm -hmm. That if the value of man is kept low, you will have slavery, whether it's in the South, wherever it is, anywhere in the world. But you have to raise the value of man through education, skills, so that you can eliminate slavery that way and it was just that was also a part of the fight which could be a whole other class there the the economics of it so that's what i was going to say on there also i wanted to add um okay. you know after after the impeachment attempt of uh, andrew johnson um you also had a bit of an erosion of the radical uh, faction, the, the pro carry faction. Uh, you had the defeat of Wade, okay? You had uh, uh, Thaddeus Stevens, he died in 1868. So, you, you, main, you had key figures 
who were involved in the battle um, who were not around anymore just because of, you know, people get old. People die, you know, people, things happen. So that's the other reason why this whole battle um, kind of got eroded. But then again, I also must say, I mean, I don't want to end it on this. I don't want to end it on this uh, defeatist attitude. I want to say, I mean, there was a tremendous amount of achievements done. There were three amendments passed in three, in five years. Uh, and there was the right to vote and uh, and and uh, the freedmen, the black uh, citizens of the South voted and they voted and they had, uh, as you saw in my last slide, they successfully got people into the into the Congress and the Senate for the first time ever, right? Um, any other questions? Uh, yes, Kelly. Kelly has a question. If you're still there, Kelly. Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Um, um yeah. Uh, I just want to say thanks, um, Magdalena, for your presentation. That was, uh, I like the angle that you're you're talking about. Um, it beats any movie that I've seen. <laughs> 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 and um, yeah, what what caught me was, you know, the the Americans. There was this the Civil War. The Americans they won. They won. They beat the South. They sur the South surrendered. And, uh, you, you know, the, the, the people who owned like those vast acres, like some of, some of these people had like thousands of acres of land and, um, uh, it's, it's almost like they should have, um, you know, separated like at least some of this land and, and giving, um, some of the, the black population, uh, at least some of the guys that fought in the war, um, like a grant just for their service in the war or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but I, I heard nothing of, um, you know, any kind of land grants or anything. Like a lot of settlers, when they came from Europe, they were they were given land, you know, from the Crown of England, of course, um, just for their services for... Um, for whatever they did for the king of the country at the time, you, you know, and that kind of carried off into the 1800s when settlers came from Europe. They, um, a lot of, a lot of the original ones had were granted like, you know, at least, at least a hundred acres, 50 acres of land. And, um, I don't know. It seems to me, you know, these black uh, population, they, they've been there for a long time and they, I don't know, they kind of deserve it. And, like to this day, I, I don't really hear of um, large scale black farms um, in the south or or anywhere. Yeah. I just I, I just kind of curious. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the intention was there. You know what Sherman da did in uh, in Carolinas there. Um, you know, Port Royal experiment, and then uh, you know it was reversed because of uh, Johnson. So that was uh, very unfortunate because uh, obviously uh, people work much better if their own if they if they have their own land, right? The, well, yeah, it's like the, land, they, land the, is, um, um, I was going to say la land is like um, it's your castle, it's um, it's your security. Um, you know, you're better off if you own a house and some property rather than like renting an apartment, like you just you tend to kind of live a better life. At least that's my experience. <laughs> and, well, you, and you apply yourself, you're applying yourself more, right? Because it is your property, okay? It yeah. is your well-being, right? You're applying yourself. You're going to go and take that extra course at night to study bookkeeping, or you're going to go and do this extra thing, learn about a new machine that you intend to buy because it is your property. You want to improve on it, Right. And exactly. you don't have that, and and you have you don't have that um, uh, that desire if if it's not your own, right? So yeah, like things could like it's too bad um, the the um, 
when they won the war, they like things um, things kind of changed after like three years. When uh, what is it, Johnson? When he became president, like it's it's kind of sad that you kind of seen these good positive events almost reversing, you know. And then you know, and these I never even heard about these black codes of eighteen sixty five until today. I, I never knew. Mm-hmm. And um, like to me, that's kind of like the root of today's problems. It kind of goes goes to that era. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, I think we have uh, one or two more questions left, and then I guess we'll have to wrap it up. We're getting to be four o'clock. We have, I think Nathan had his hand up, and also Susan had a, Susan had a question she wanted me to uh, ask, so I'll ask that one, Madeline. What role did Frederick Douglass play in this part of the story? And if you can keep your answer to less than two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be an entire other class, right? Okay. Um, yeah, can't really. Hmm. You're probably better at answering that, Jerry. Well, Frederick Douglass played an enormous part in this because he was constantly trying to get Lincoln to free the slaves, have Emancipation Proclamation earlier. But uh, Lincoln just didn't feel he had the support where it would pass. And... uh, Douglas did an enormous amount of work uh, with his own newspaper in building support for it among the African-American population, the free population in the North, and um, also in getting African-Americans to enlist in the Union Army. And that was a big fight, and even getting them their own company to fight because it, you know, the prejudice was, oh, they weren't as good as, you know, whites and they proved themselves to be. And, uh, but yeah, a whole class could be given on Frederick Douglass and the work he did in the war. The particular importance of him was when he broke with the radical abolitionists You had this whole group of abolitionists in the north around uh, Garrison, William Lord Garrison. Now, their solution to the way (laughs) they were saying the way we can uh, end slavery is the north should secede for the Union. Now, what is that going to do about slavery in the south? Nothing. How many people will be freed in the South because of that, nothing. So it was a whole operation run through British intelligence to split the Union, either by the South or the radical abolitionists in the North to just secede from the Union. And Douglas, to his credit, recognized, no, that's not the way we do it. We are going to save the union, keep it together, and we are constitutionally going to make slavery illegal. There's an interesting story of that because it's in the Constitution. Slavery is in it, and you would have had to get a constitutional amendment to eliminate it, except in times of war, the commander-in-chief had the power to do it, which is how Lincoln did it. As commander in chief, he passed the, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, Frederick Douglass met with him many times and advised him many times on that. But Susan, that's a whole other class on that great man. But one other thing that uh, little picture that Madeline showed of the statue of Lincoln and 
the freed slave that's in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. When that statue was unveiled, it was unveiled by President Grant, who was there that day. And the speech at the unveiling was given by Frederick Douglass. So um. that should tell you that. But the answer to that would take two hours, Susan. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, uh, Nathan, you had your hand up. You Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me? Huh? Yes? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, so I really um, thank you for a wonderful and educational presentation because I got a, I had a lot of questions and um, that I'll have to look into and stuff. I just was really um, interested in. So the the churches that they funded a lot of a lot of the programs through the churches and the military and the churches. The different churches had different denominations, but they had different like a Baptist was sort of the mother church. They didn't just make new churches. They worked through the churches to unite the, you know, and then the, so I thought that was um, just really powerful because it unites a lot of people. It brought a social uh, healing to the communities. And then, um, and its legacy in, in the populations is like, look at Martin Luther King and what he did. And, and uh, then the, is the six, it's a silly question, but I mean, so did he, did, did Lincoln compromise when he, with the succession of the presidency, making, making an Andrew Johnson the vice president, or was it different back then? <laughs> uh, because that would never happen now. They would always have a, somebody from their party as the vice president or something like that. And then, yeah. then with Seward, I didn't know that Seward was um, one of the, uh, British free traders, um, but he worked closely with Grant, Grant's presidency, and um, so with, was Grant just sort of thinking that he could unite people by taking a middle ground? Okay, so um, okay, um, the first first thing about the Freedmen's Association. Okay, so the different churches. Um, they set up their own, it's like a committee, right? You, you have a church and you set up a committee. Um, you know, every, every Thursday morning, we're going to have the seniors coming to our church and they're going to get coffee and we do a program with them and so forth, right? So it's a committee, okay? So they set up these committees for the Freedmen's Association, right? So they would have, okay, so we're going to collect money, we're going to collect, okay, food, clothes, et cetera, et cetera, okay, to help the freedmen in the South, okay? And then they would send representatives South, or they would send uh, young ladies that were not married yet, but they were a certain age, and they could be school teachers. They would send them South, and they would cost, they would pay their, for their costs, for their housing, and for, so, et cetera, et cetera, to, to be school teachers, right? So, but then you had all these churches doing this, on their own, okay, and, you know, they're almost falling over each other, right, because everybody was doing this, because this was, this was a purpose, this is a Christian duty, right, the Christian duty is to follow, to, to help your fellow man, okay, and, and so, so they, they did this, the volunteerism, they did this, uh, to work together for, to help, um, and but they recognized that everybody was doing kind of every single of these churches was doing their own thing, and they recognized they needed to have an overview. They needed to have somebody in charge of conducting the different interests, and that's what uh, that's what then came out when they when they had the national convention, uh, when they had a convention where they got all these different churches to come in. Uh, they're I guess the chairman of that. Freedmen's Association Committee, okay, would be there, uh, and they would have a discussion, and they came to the conclusion that they needed one person in, in the government that they could have a liaison with, and that they could report to, and that they would, and then he would have the oversight, and then he would direct different people to different, 
to different things, right? So that was uh, that was very good. Um, okay, now um, okay, Lincoln, Lincoln, um, when he was elected, I mean, he was not. He didn't get elected with an overwhelming majority. It was pretty close, right? And the way he got elected is by getting Andrew Johnson as his sidekick. So that's the, that was the problem, but that's how he how he did it. Um, and that was his weak, kind of his weak point, right? His weak side. So I'm sure, you know, people make deals like that now, nowadays all the time, too. It's politics. Um, any, what else was it that I was supposed to address? Um, with Seward and Grant, but yeah. Yeah. No, uh, there were a number of, I was surprised by a number of things. I mean, this, the, some of these guys were pro, okay? They were definitely... Uh, for emancipation of the slaves, and 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 they were very, they fought for that. Okay, but their weak side was they were pro-British, and you know, and thus carry very clearly out like this is our opportunity to get rid of once and for all of the influence of the British oligarchy, the British free trade people uh, from the United States. Okay, this reconstruction, we have now an opportunity to kick these people out once and for all. And Seward was not in favor of that. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add one point to that. I keep sticking my nose in here, but... No, it's fine. If you look at the presidential elections, the history of them you'll find that the person who was elected president with the lowest number of electoral votes was John Quincy Adams. And I think the person with the second lowest number of electoral votes was Abraham Lincoln. And he won because there was three or four candidates, so he had the most of them. So he didn't have an overwhelming majority population supporting him. So he did have to make certain compromises so that he could have the uh, majority behind him. And one other point that you mentioned, Nathan, the, the voluntarism of the churches in the work of the Freedmen's Bureau. In the South, not only was it illegal to teach a slave to read and write, it was also illegal to teach him about religion. And, you know, you read stories about how somehow one fellow would somehow learn a certain bit about religion and they'd have these meetings at night they'd all have to sneak away from the plantation and go in the woods in secret and he would you know teach them about the bible and about religion and so all of these freed slaves had very little knowledge of religion too so this was like a gold mine for these churches. They could send their missionaries down into the <laughs> South and preach to these newly freed slaves and not just teach them about the Bible, but also teach them hymns, church songs. And there's a whole other class, two hours long at least, you <laughs> give about the development of the African American church songs that were called Negro spirituals. Now we have to call them African American spirituals, but they're really beautiful. And it's, it's a independent school of music that was developed out of that, the emancipation movement in the South. And even when, um, well, 
that's a whole class on it. I don't want to go for another two hours, but it was a very good point you brought up there, Nathan. I just wanted to mention that. Well, so now know, we've got them set I'm, up for another four or five classes, right? I want to add, Jerry, not just that it was fertile ground for the churches in the South, okay? You actually showed what Christianity really was, right? You recruit, yes, you recruit in the South, okay? But how do you do it? Not just by talking about religion, but you actually are acting that way. So anyway, that's just my point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think we've reached our allotted time for today. And uh, thank everybody for uh, being here, listening to this, and also for people who will listen to it later. And I hope everybody comes next week. I'm not sure what the presentation will be on, but Magdalena, if you had a few closing words you'd like to leave us with, it's all yours. Uh, very quickly, uh, Magdalena, have you written any book or a paper on this? Uh, is it available somewhere else? Because I'd, I'd like to learn in more detail about the British uh, uh, mm, I have an, uh, one of the things I would recommend, okay, of reading, because I took a lot of information from that, is this article here from EIR. Okay. Okay. Just quickly take a picture. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, the book by Alan Salisbury. Um Alan Salisbury, you said? Yes. Jerry, what's the book yeah. title again? Yeah, The Civil War. And Try Tim to Hull. hold it up. Yeah. If you can see that, Karinder. I'll take a picture again, yeah. Okay, The like. Civil War and the American System. A little bit higher Alan so we can see the author, Jerry. Okay, there you go. That's out the main screen. Okay. Did you get that? Um. I, I got the, I got the title. I, okay, now I see it. S A L I S B U R Y. Okay, that's good. Yes, Alan Salisbury. All right, got it. Yeah. Okay. Definitely recommend those. Thank you. And then this presentation will be also posted at Rising Tide. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much. I think it was a definitely was a pleasure. Um, I actually, I enjoy giving presentations because it forces me to delve into a topic and then and then really um, wade through it, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always good. Thanks, so, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Very okay. Much. Take care. Take care, okay. everybody. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And we'll see you all next Sunday. Yes. Bye. Bye. When Israel was in Egypt.